coming to your offering. I appreciate what Brother Doug shared tonight because it goes hand in hand with what I want to share for a little bit tonight and work more uh, last uh, next week at the rest of uh, this chapter that we're going to look at. I've been trying to over the past since the beginning of the year look at things that are theologically correct and help us understand uh, why we believe what we believe uh, from a, a biblical perspective to be able to defend that. And so tonight I want us to look at uh, what we're going to be celebrating next week. Uh, or maybe not in the same realm as we're celebrating next week. But does anyone know what next week holds? Valentine's Day. My wife remembers. That means I gotta remember. The other guys are fortunate. Your wives didn't say anything, so uh, uh, so you so you're off the hook, right? <laughs> Turn with me to First Corinthians chapter number thirteen. And uh, I may instead of. We'll see how things flow. My thoughts are to allow you to share uh, after I get through certain uh, points that I want to get through for you to share after that point or however that may be instead of waiting to the end, which we typically do, and then we have conversation and dialogue. But having Bible study tonight be that we're going to participate in the interim between different uh, topics of the breakdown of 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 that we're going to look at. And so I'm going to read uh, down to verse number 8, and then we're going to bounce back, and then we'll dissect it a little bit more uh, 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 intensely. And that, that clock's not working back there. It got me in trouble on Sunday, so I'm trying to be cautious uh, and uh, not extend myself too much or uh, extend you too much. The Word of God says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Charity uh, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity or in sin, but rejoiceth in truth, but beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Now, one of the words that's thrown around very loosely in the society that we live in, and uh, I told you that we're, we're, we're looking at love, although it's Valentine's Day, we're looking at love from God's perspective. We'll talk a little bit more, just very briefly in a moment, about what Valentine's Day would be from man's perspective. And yes, Valentine's Day comes from uh, uh, paganism. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, I, I don't believe that you get shot with a cupid, uh, an arrow in the heart. I do believe that uh, emotions can, you know, are tricky things. And, you know, you can all of a sudden not realize it and then your head over your heels in love. Uh, and so uh, it, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, thank God for love, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing. And, uh, but I don't want to necessarily talk about love in that realm, although love is thrown around loosely in the day and age that we live in. In the 1960s and the 1970s, there was a term that was used freely uh, from what I read. I, I, I was just young in the 70s, so I don't remember that. Some of you may remember a little bit more, but they talked about free love. Free love. And uh, 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 really, uh, what most people consider love is not love, 
the world has it a little bit uh, distorted and they think love equates to lust. That's not what love is, and it's certainly not what love is when we look at the Word of God here, but that, that terminology in the, in the 60s and 70s, and has just evolved and is common in society today, uh, 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 you know, that, that free love, it, it really meant this. It meant uh, uh, engaging in activities uh, uh, that God designed for marriage, uh, without any type of atta attachments or any type of, of, of responsibility to that attachment. And so it's totally different than what God intends for love because there is an attachment and there is a responsibility that we as believers need to love. And so although the, 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 the term is thrown around in, in today's society, grossly uh, twisted and, 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 and perverted, if I could say it that way, God's love is not. God's love and what God wants us to have in the way of love in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 is quite different. I want you to imagine this love chapter is tossed right in here. I shouldn't even say tossed. I mean, it's given to us between chapter 12 and chapter number 14, obviously. Chapter number 12, uh, Paul was talking about the endowment of spiritual gifts. And then in chapter number 14, uh, he talks about how to exercise spiritual gifts. So he's talking about spiritual gifts uh, 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 beginning and closing uh, of, of what he's talking about love as he writes this epistle to the Corinthians. And uh, he's talking about uh, uh, for us to really have spiritual gifts and really be able to utilize spiritual gifts the way that God wants us to utilize spiritual gifts is we have to love. We have to love. And we'll understand more as we look at this chapter, but seeing the context in which it's said, uh, spiritual gifts is really about having a love for others and having a love for God. And, and Paul told the Corinthians uh, in, in chapter number 12, uh, uh, he, he said the best way for, for, for them to, to live a Christian life is to love God and to love people. Brother Doug, you said that when you were taking up a prayer request. That pastor was setting a, a good platform because he was showing folks that you need to love people genuinely. As you, as you verbalize and as your life says you love God, if you really love God, you'll really love other people. Let me just tell you, anybody that works a public job, you deal with people, and I think almost probably the majority of everybody in here had, has or does, you can realize how exhausting it can be to be a service to other people. It can be draining. But you know what makes us as believers good men and women of service? Is because we really love God. And God has changed our natural nature to really love people. And that is the best example of being a believer is loving people. God you know, what we might think is love really doesn't match up sometimes to God's definition of love. So let's look at this. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or have not love, he said, I've become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. So very simply stated here, uh, Paul is speaking... And he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Let's talk, let's talk about this for just a few moments. What is angel language? Well, he said, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels. What would angel language be? I believe that that definitely goes hand in hand, especially when we link it on over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 18, 
that he said, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you all. So I think there's a lot to take in here. I think that he's talking about spiritual gifts and spiritual things. He's talking about the, the gift of tongues. Uh, he, he could be talking about uh, 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 as well. Did you ever think about what did the angel, how did it speak to, how did the angel speak to the shepherds? Was it in some language that was unknown to them? I believe he spoke in English to them. I believe when he came to uh, Mary, Joseph, he spoke in English, right? So, I, you know, there's some people who try to negate tongues here, and they'll use that as an example. But I believe that when he says men and angels, we look at this, we can, we can encompass a lot of things here. So there can be this eloquent language that can be used because we know terminology. Did you ever go down to the pump here, down here in Lycans? I, I, I sometimes, uh, uh, when you swipe your fuel rewards card, if you ever look there, that all of a sudden gas station TV will come on and they'll give you a word of the day. And so I always look at that because it's usually a word that I don't know or use. And so, you know, those are all good things. You know, you study, you know, those, those things that are eloquent. So it can be, I believe, an eloquent earthly language. It can be uh, the language of tongue. I think that we can look and see a lot here when we look at this. And I think there's no negating that it is not a heavenly language that is only known in the heavenlies that God gives us when he fills us with the Holy Ghost. And I'll go as far to say, he says of men and angels, it can also be just eloquent language that we can learn because of, of knowledge and study. And so he says, if, 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 if you speak, and we know that the angel spoke to Abraham too, uh, uh, when he was uh, about Sodom, he spoke to him at an earthly time, uh, the shepherds to Mary. And so here it is, uh, uh, whether it's uh, a, a man's language or a heavenly language, however you want it to be, amen, that, that uh, if, if a person uses this, but yet they're void of real love, the Bible says that they are a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. We'll talk more about that in a moment, that tinkling cymbal. Now, when in our language, we've kind of derived everything to come down to just speak one word, love. I love you. So, you know, I can say I love my wife. My wife's love is different than I say to my girls, I love you. Or I may be saying uh, 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 something about, uh, Sister Dot, your cookies that you made for Christmas. I love your cookies. You know, or you can say, I love my job. I love my vehicle. It's all one word, love, but we know that it all has a different connotation. But actually in the Greek, uh, you'll find that, that there are four different words that are used for love. And uh, the word translated love uh, 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 here uh, in, in this translation is agape love. And, and you'll find that uh, when it's, it's translated uh, love, it will be translated in the Bible. It's been translated 85 times and 28 times they put the word charity in the place of where love is. And so uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, definition of love, we need to go back to the Greek. So we can look at love and we can think about it on many levels. And we can think of charity when we think about that. What, what comes to your mind when you think about charity? If I say, well, we need to show charity to someone. What do you think? Love. Love. Not everyone thinks love. What do you think? If we're going to have a charity, what are we going to do? We're going to raise money. We're going to show charity to someone. Their house is burnt down. Let's show them some charity. Now, you can have charity without having love. In fact, if you want to be real honest about it, let's think about charity and what that is. It can actually even be very political. Because our government is good at charity. 
That is what uh, uh, medical assistance is, is based on. Uh, folks give part of their paycheck and, and, and it goes to our government and then they give charity to folks to provide housing or food or uh, medical assistance, however that is. And so, not all that's been done below. It's just done because that's what we do that's politically correct. And so, we need to understand what love is from the Bible. We need to understand what charity is because our whole definition can be kind of mired and, and ruined because of, of the culture that we live in. So let's, let's look at what charity means. Let's look at what, what, what love is. And so once again, charity is a political philosophy. Uh, God is speaking of real love here, not some political thing that we need to do. And so there are four types of love in the Bible. The first love that, 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 are, that, that is in the Greek is E-R-O-S. And it's about a love that a man has for his wife. And so that would be more of a passionate love. Actually, when we, when we come into the New Testament, that word is never used at all, actually. It's never a word that's used in the Greek that's translated love. So we know that it's not the same love that God is speaking about here, a love between a man and a wife. The second definition uh, that, that is in the Greek is uh, philia. And it's kind of the, the, the warm feeling that, that, that we have when something is near and dear to our heart. However, philia is not the word that's translated here. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angel and have not that feeling that's dear to my heart. God's not talking about that feeling. The third definition of the Greek is storage, believe it or not. And it means affection. The same affection like a parent has toward their child. Now, even here in, in the translation, it's not affection that, that, that is being used. But the word that is being used is agape. And agape love means this. It means unconquering benevolence. It means goodwill. It doesn't mean a feeling of the heart, it, 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 uh, which we can't help. Sometimes we just love people. You know, how many of you really love your kids? It's crazy, isn't it? You know, I know that part of it probably is a choice, but, you know, they can warm me up pretty good and get things out of me. You know, uh, 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 please, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how we feel. And so, but, but it's not a feeling of the heart that God wants us to have. He wants us to have this agape love that's this unconquering benevolence. And, 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 and it means no matter what a person says or how they injure us or how they insult us, they humil humiliate us. We never seek anything else for them except for the highest good of that person. Wow, that is love. You ever been humiliated by someone? Do you know what your natural man wants to do? Or let your tongue just get out of control and give them a big old uh, a, a kick in the gut with your tongue. But that's not the love that God wants us to have. You see, when we really have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, the old nature is conquered. And we love God. And God engrafts in us a genuine love for people. Bottom line. No matter what they do to us, we still seek the highest good for them. Wow. That is the life-changing love that God places in our hearts. Because we no longer live in the flesh, but we live in Christ. See... It concerns our will more than it concerns our emotions. Because God has taken over our will. And our emotions will not lead us. It describes a deliberate effort that we can only make with the help of God never to seek anything for those who want the worst for us. Did you hear me? 
never to seek anything but good for those who want nothing but the worst for us. Do you ever meet someone who wants you to fail or you know that they have it out for you? But the love of God is a deliberate act that you still want the best for them no matter how they treat you. That is a agape love. And God says, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, I can be eloquent, I can be whatever words I choose to use, I can even allow the Spirit of God to move through me, and I can speak with other tongues, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. And so with this kind of love, it doesn't seek revenge, but instead... It meets all injuries and it buffets it with nothing but goodwill and kindness. We can only have agape love when Christ conquers our natural tendencies. Wow. That's challenging tonight. And Paul, he had this type of love it's interesting, and I found this, and maybe I knew before, I don't know, sometimes I, when I read, there's things that I read and study, maybe I know it before, but it's like, man, it comes back on, and somewhere in the portals of time, I forgot. But most feel that Paul was making reference to all the religious activity that was going on around about these folks here at Corinth. And in the religious activities they were having, they would be very loud. There would be music. There would be uh, uh, drinking. There would be confusion. There would be just uh, uh, meanness. And he said, you know what it's like for those folks who say they are religious, but you see them living wild. You see their attitudes. And you see how they treat other people. And in their music, they are, are in their, their worship. They will crash this, the, the, the symbol. And, 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 and it's nothing but an empty hollowness because the religion means nothing. He said, but when you have Christ, it's not a symbol of emptiness. It's not just clattering. <clears throat> But it's the real deal. That even when people do you wrong, you show them a benevolence and a love that's greater than any harm they can bring your way. Wow, that's just, it's powerful. Because all the Corinthians could see that the worship of these other deities did nothing in the lives of their followers. But those who live for Christ, the deity of who he is, changes the essence of who they are by nature. And they love unconditionally. Does anyone have anything they want to say right here before I move on to verse number two? You know, we may think that we are something, but Paul said, if you don't have love for others, you're nothing. I was just going to say the first thing I thought of when I got when you read about the king of symbol and sign of the grasses. You know, it's, um, at least my mind went back to the Pharisees. You know, they looked good on the outside, but yet they were, um, Jesus called them white sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Um, he said about speaking in tongues of men and angels, you know, how many keep times have we seen people that were uh, <coughs> using the gifts or uh, done this for the church or done this or that, and yet when you really got down to know them, they were hypocrite, they were completely different. And then how do people respond to them? You know, they say, they, they say, and they don't love other people like God loves people. It's nothing but a bunch of clattering and noise and not like this, when we think of symbol, it's not like our symbol on our drum. It's just clattering and banging the noise. Exactly right without Christ. We're nothing. Anybody else have a thought on that? Let's move on to verse 2. 
He says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Do you know God honors people? And I believe God wants us to be loving. God is working on us. We can have gifts, but yet fall short. And so here it is that Paul the Apostle paints this picture. And he's painting a picture of the, the, the person with a gift of prophecy. He understands secrets. He understands mysterious things of God and and uh, he has knowledge gifts of knowledge he can even have knowledge as far as doctorate degrees on his wall but if he doesn't have love Paul said he has he's nothing and he can even have faith or she can even have faith so that they uh, uh, can remove mountains that's powerful that you say be thou removed and cast into the sea that's great faith. But Paul said, you can have all that faith, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. He's talking about a love that no matter what anyone does to you, you turn around and you treat them well and you love. And our lives, our lives are a reflection of Christ. We talked about it last week, I believe it was, where John wrote, he said, I, Jesus speaking here, he said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. What did Jesus do when they spit on him? They cursed him? Uh, they, they, they did all types of evil things against him. What did he do? Father, forgive me. For they know not what they do. Even in their very sin, their gambling, their mockery, he was dying on the cross for them. And he died because of love. And so if we say, I am in Christ, whether Eli, whatever that 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 vine, the branches are going to produce what the vine has. And if it's connected to the vine, it's going to be producing. So Paul was saying this. Listen, if you're really connected, you're going to be producing love. Verse number three, he goes on down to say, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now, this word, uh, uh, bestow, it means this. Any of you ever uh, seen on uh, 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 a nature movie or maybe you've seen by experience, you ever seen a mama bird come and she has something and she puts it in the baby bird's mouth? That's exactly what this word bestow means. I mean, it's nurturing. It's taking care of, uh, just giving, giving it away, uh, really mouth uh, full by mouth full, uh, feeding uh, those, those little bits into the mouth. He said, you, you, you can give it all away. You can make sure everyone is taken care of. But if you do all that and you don't have love, he said this, it profits you nothing. You know why? Because some people, they get out of duty and they don't get out of love. Our love for God and our love for others will cause us to have benevolence in our duty because we love others, we will give. <coughs> wow. It's powerful. God doesn't want us to give from a heart of drudgery. He wants us to give from a heart of love. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul writes and he said, Let every man, according as he purposed it in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God wants us to love. He said this, he said, you can give 
give your body to be burned? And if you have love it, and you don't have love, it doesn't profit you anything. You know what? You can say I'm willing to die for the cause of Christ. But if your actions and your heart's desire does not line up, it will benefit you nothing. You can give all your possessions away. You can give your life away. But if you don't do it out of love, you waste it all. That's why you need to pay your time. You care it in love and carefully to your own kids to the work of God. Amen. That's like a friend of mine kind of then she said that the mother you know takes the store to the store and, and she goes and picks the store up for the mother. She does it because of love. Brother Eli, that's why tithing really becomes a matter of our heart. We do it because God commands us to. Right. And you want to do it. That's right. But we do it because we love God. But if you just do it to the Bible say, that don't mean nothing unless you do it for God. Amen. I, I, I appreciate Brother Doug and Sister Tina's testimony several years ago. They shared that always tithe. Even when they had very little, they budgeted, they tithed, they put God first priority. And now, their tithe is what they used to make. Because they were faithful. And when you do it because you love God, God will bless us. It should never be, it should never just be out of duty to pay our tithe or to give to anyone. It should be because we love God and we love people. And you know what? Sometimes giving doesn't, you know, our looking, we shouldn't say, well, they already have, or they, they have this, or even they have more than me. <clears throat> but if there's still a need, and if God places it on your heart, we need to give because we love God and we love others. It has nothing to do with any other factors. Because Christ has changed us. And we give. And we don't do it because it's a charity or because it's politically correct. We do it because we really love people. I have to tell you something. Um, I'm going to brag on a co worker of mine. I'll tell you what, I have a co worker, and that lady is a very giving, just a very giving kind person. And the other morning when I um, I hit that deer and uh, I, I my car wasn't drivable. And you know, I, I work a job that I need to get there because there's people there waiting on me. And uh, I called my coworker and I said, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be there on time. I hit a deer and my car's messed up. And, uh, I didn't call with the intentions of wanting her to come pick me up. I called her, but, but immediately, hey, I'm on my way. I'll come pick you up. Where are you at? <laughs> you know why? Because there's a real love for people. Yeah. And we as believers, <clears throat> we need to have a real love for people. Not feel like we're inconvenienced by things, but see it as an opportunity to serve others. As Christ has served us. That's your love. Uh, let me move on just a little bit ahead for, for a few moments. Um, I know let's, there was a guy that he, he thought I was paying 10%. And as a door present, he ended up paying 90%. Wow. Wow. God is good. The word of God goes on to us in verse number four, verse, verse number seven. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity or love envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, 
does not behave itself unseemingly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. I'm not going to cover all these this evening, but let's just look at this first one. The, 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 the Word of God says that it suffereth long. Uh, that, that word suffereth long, when we look into the etymology of it, what it really, really means, you know, we think suffereth long, being patient. Uh, doesn't really quite describe the word, uh, but when we see this suffereth long, it means not to lose heart, but to uh, preserve patiently and bravely, enduring trouble and misfortune. To be patient in hearing offenses and injuries of others, slow to punish, slow to anger, to demonstrate restraint without uh, being provoked. Wow, that's a whole lot of information in a little bit of work. And so what does God want from that? You know, sometimes we think love is uh, love, 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 uh, love uh, charity, suffering. We think, oh, I, I got to endure this. I, I got I, I to gotta go through this. That's not really what it means. I got to go through loss. I got to go through difficulty. It really means this, is that we are patient with those who may be the cause of loss, hurt, difficulty, pain. Any of you ever have someone cause you loss? Hurt, difficulty, pain. And so it means that we suffer for that person. So if every day you go into work and your boss is mean as the devil to you, how should you respond? Yes, we get weary. But that's when we allow the Spirit of God to rise up in us. And we treat that person with love. You see, it's being patient with people who choose to cause us circumstances that make things difficult. Think about this for a moment. If you look at the Old Testament, is there anyone in the Old Testament that you look at and you think, man, they demonstrated love? Anyone you can think of? Give me a name. Absolutely, Joseph. So his brothers didn't want him to excel and succeed. They should have rejoiced with him for what God had provided for his life. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Listen, if someone gets the accolades and someone gets the promotion and someone gets more than what uh, we're doing, even though we're doing the same job, how should we respond to that? Well, Joseph shows us how to respond. We respond in love. And so his brothers didn't like it, and they sold him into slavery. We see the chain uh, uh, reaction of his life, uh, uh, of Potiphar's wife in the prison. Here he is, but yet even when people are, are wronging him, he is a man who shows love, and he is patient, and he shows that even though they, sh they cause me difficult circumstances, I am willing to show charity. Because charity Suffer long. Wow. Look at Tatum. Absolutely. He made it that he could have given the king, didn't he? Absolutely. Why not? Because he was God's anointing. Yeah. And he said, God, that's not mine to do. Even though I'm anointed to be king and there he is in that position, and even though he's done me <coughs> wrong and he's tried to kill me. David could have killed Saul. Yeah. But he didn't. Yeah. Instead, he chose the charity suffer long. So the elements of love is that it is restraint. You see, David waited on God. I'm going to close with this story. I'll give you an opportunity to say something. It was said of Hitler during World War II that he took 
and command uh, religious groups to come and unite that he could have control of them. Now, even though he took these religious groups and he had control of them, there were some that said, whatever Hitler says, I'm going to do. And they followed Hitler even in their religious group. I'm going to leave it at that. But there were other religious groups that said, we're not going to adhere to everything Hitler tells us to do. Now, I'm not here to talk about these groups, but what I am saying is that group that did not adhere, they suffered a lot of loss. Loss of family members, loss of things. And so when it was all over and said and done, here were these religious groups, and they were at odds with one another. And so what they decided they would do is they would bring the leaders of these religious groups together. And it was said by Francis Schaeffer, who tells a story. He said that when these religious groups come together, he said they allow themselves just to sit together and they confess their hostility uh, and their bitterness to God and, and they yield it to the control of God and all of a sudden these groups that were uh, at, at odds with one another, the Spirit of God just brought them together when they allowed God to be God and they didn't try to lash out at one another. You see, when the Spirit of God prevails, in the midst of believers, God will be edified and the world will see that Christ makes a difference. His love is passed on to His people and His people exhibit love. John said this in John 13, 35, but this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have Love for one another. Now, I appreciate what that what you said because we as a church need to have love for one another. Everybody. Because love serves and love is patient. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who shows us that love? certainly is long-suffering. It suffers long because that's what Christ has done for us. And all of our offenses, what does He do? He loves us. And when we fail Him, what does He do? He loves us. It's really what love is. God help us as believers reflect the love of God. Does that, anyone have anything they want to say tonight? We'll talk more about it. But thank God for good Bible characters that show us love. Anyone? If not, let's stand tonight. Thank you for being here. Once again, good to have my mother mother in law you have to be out and about tomorrow, be, be safe. Trust the Lord to take good care of you. Come back on Sunday. Um, let's